Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in tonight. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, the Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Emma Klein to discuss her new collection of stories, Daddy, published by our friends at Random House. In these 10 remarkable stories, Emma Klein portrays moments when the ordinary is disturbed, when daily life buckles, revealing the perversity and violence pulsing under the surface. Daddy's 10 masterful, provocative stories confirm that Klein is a staggering talent, says Esquire. And the New York Times book review writes, these stories vibrate with life. Emma Klein is the author of The Girls, which was shortlisted for the Center for Fiction's first novel prize and the John Leonard Award from the National Book Critics Circle. She received the Plimpton Prize from the Paris Review and was chosen as one of Granta's best young American novelists. In conversation with Emma this evening is Numi Fry. Numi is a staff writer at The New Yorker where she writes about popular culture, books, and art. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to those right after their talk. You can find Daddy Stories for purchase at Books and Books below by pressing the green button. Every purchase you make helps keep Books and Books up and running, so don't hold back. And now, without further ado, I'd like to bring our guests to the stage. Hi. Hi. Hi, Nomi. Hi, Hi Emma. How are you? <laughs> good. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn. You're in Los Angeles. I'm in Los Angeles. We're both wearing black. I know. I feel that we are weirdly uh, coordinated. You have a new haircut. It looks really good. Nice. I just cut off all my hair. Uh, and my concern, which I shared with you, was that I perhaps look like Crispin Glover. Never. I mean, Never. I love Crispin. I love him. <laughs> So maybe, maybe you do because you look lovely. Um, <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, we're here to talk about your incredible book of stories, Daddy, that just uh, came out uh, earlier in the month. Uh, and I was really excited when I heard you had a new book coming out because I love the girls when it came out. Uh, we know each other now, but when the girls came out, I didn't know you. I read it independently of you and, um, I loved it and I thought, uh, here's a woman who is interested in a lot of the things that are interesting to me, not that that should interest you, but to my own like, you know, uh, egocentric satisfaction. I was like, oh, okay, she's, she's dealing with uh, the sort of uh, fight for uh, domination between men and women. <laughs> she's dealing with power, she's dealing with sex. She's interested in American subcultures. She's interested in celebrities. And so for me, it was very exciting to discover you as a writer and then later as a person. And uh, when reading these stories, uh, which, you know, a couple of them I'd read previously uh, in, in magazines, various forms, um, I, you know, I was struck that it was like the novel and also not like the novel, obviously, stories are quite different. And also the style seems a little more uh, pared down. Um, and, uh, but, but those same preoccupations that animated you in your novel seem to remain a, a focal point here. And I hope that tonight we can talk a little bit about some of those preoccupations. Um, and so let's maybe let's just start with a question that we talked about casually, but I haven't really, you know, like probed it deeper with you um, about the title of the collection. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what uh, prompted you picking that title? I know you said a friend, a mutual friend of ours, uh, helped you come up with it, but obviously you had a hand in deciding. What were your thoughts about it? Yeah, um, so this mutual friend of ours is one of my first readers. So he reads most everything that I write in pretty early stages. And I told him, you know, I'm trying to come up with a title for this collection. And he knew all the stories and we were sort of talking it through. And I think initially sort of as a joke, he proposed daddy because it's such an incendiary word. It's so loaded. 
Um, but the more we kind of talked about it, the more the words seemed to apply in really interesting ways to all of the different stories. I mean, it's a word that has this very innocent uh, meaning and this sort of wholesome familial affect and then is also so loaded and so fraught and has come to represent so much about like power and sex and gender and like to me there's something about that duality of innocence and sort of darkness or complexity that I think is what I'm drawn to most as a writer and that yeah. I sort of see coming up over and over in stories it's like the ambient the ambient vibe of all the stories so yeah I, yeah I kind of ended up really liking liking the word it's interesting that you mentioned innocence because certainly I think for anyone reading you know your novel and now these stories the darker part you know the the power the sex the the struggles uh, for uh, kind of ascendance, uh, hierarchies, and so on, uh, which uh, are invoked in some ways by this title word, are evident. But as for the kind of innocence or the more like sort of naked childlike desire for love or meaning, I wonder how you see that. Because when I was reading the stories, I was like, Okay, like I, I was trying to kind of locate what we might call the positive and not positive in the sense of like goodness, like absolute goodness, but like what are these people seeking? What is their innermost desire? Um, apart from the jockeying for attention, for, you know, recognition, uh, for power. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just like, I, I was wondering yeah. if you saw that. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, the first story that maybe comes to mind is the opening story in the collection, What Can You Do With a General? That's kind of about this father and who's maybe in his 60s and sort of hit a Christmas with his adult children. And Christmas from kind of hell. <laughs> Sorry? Christmas from hell. <laughs> Christmas from hell. Yes. Um, and I was thinking sort of what's the innocence there? And it's like this belief that he has in the family system or like the inherent goodness of family no matter what. Uh, or the idea that, I, which I think is, is a very strong dominant message that uh, your family loves you, you love them. Uh, this is like, a closed perfect system um even though i find family systems so fraught and so like diseased often yeah um so i i thought about it a little in that story like the idea of daddy like and he keeps invoking um pa from the little house on the prairie like these very idealized versions and pa was fucked up like in, in real life, I, I read the Laura Ingalls Wilder biography. And I mean, he wasn't fucked, he wasn't like a monster, but he was a real person who really fucked the family over <laughs> time and again. He kept, you know, losing their, you know, possessions and like moving out west and like uprooting them. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. But all this energy that goes into the narrative that like Pa is this like magical, godlike figure. Yeah. And the, uh, you, you know, all the narrative energy we expend um, on the idea that like families are like perfect and you can get love from your family and they love you, you love them. Um, or like the relationships between men and women, like, oh, uh oh, did I cut out? Oh. oh no, it's like a little green monster. Emma, what happened? Uh, Emma, I'm gonna prompt you back in, okay? Oh, so, I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Those I'm things happen. Alone. You're still on there. Hang on. Um, I guess we can keep on talking. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Okay. It was what we had tried so hard to avoid. I think the glitches are part of the journey. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very 
<laughs> That's very enlightened. So I just reprompted you. Okay. It's happening, I hope. Let's see. She's I think she's gonna try to get okay. back on. Are you there? Not yet. She's not okay. there yet. Oh, okay. I can see her accepting and trying to connect. Okay. So she's coming back. Is it? There we go. Yay! Yay! <laughs> okay. Yeah. Good. Never leave me again. <laughs> I, know. I felt. I felt terrible. I felt it was a personal failing. Yeah, that's what happened to me in the last event that I did that I told you about. I got <laughs> getting kicked out and it was just, the shame was just overwhelming. I know, it, it does feel personal. It feels very personal. I'm doing something <laughs> wrong. Um, but it, yeah, so you were talking about the idealized figure of the family and, and, the, and, and, the, and the father. And, you know, just, just to pivot to another question and that you've been, I know, sort of asked a lot, um, and but it is interesting, especially uh, in in this day and age, you know, when questions of uh, representation and who gets to have their story told, and you know, it's it's kind of like for me an admirable but also potentially perverse choice to be like, okay, I'm gonna write about rapists. <laughs> Or like, or, you know, not necessarily, I mean, you wrote about this Weinstein figure in, in the most recent mm -hmm. you had in the New Yorker, which isn't in the collection, but not necessarily rapists, but just, uh, I mean, let's say at best complicated men, right? Yeah. Which, um, I mean, again, personally, I always find that really interesting, um, but I'm, I'm wondering at, at your, oh, obviously you also have women protagonists and, and, and it's, stories that are about men are also about women. I, 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 you know, I don't want to look at this like in any way that's uh, flattening, but it is a, a, a big a kind of theme in your work. And I, I'm wondering about that. Like, why do you think you're drawn to these stories? Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's not, not perverse. <laughs> we need to yeah. do so. Which is like, you know, something I like about it. Yeah. Um, but I, I think a lot of it just came out naturally from sort of existing in the world, especially the last four or five years as a yeah. woman and in the kind of closed system that you and I kind of operated in, in New York where there was a lot of energy expended on very, like these very specific men and their very specific wrongdoings. Um, yeah. And the idea of trying to inhabit that consciousness from a fictional perspective, I mean, it, it didn't feel totally insane no. just based on the amount of energy everyone I knew was expending on trying to parse these men or, you, you know, doing things in reaction to these men or, or trying yeah. in essays to kind of understand these men. Like, uh, and, and I think especially after writing The Girls, which was so much about c kind of a character who felt herself at the mercy of these forces around her, often yeah. like male, there was something mm -hmm. interesting for me and even a little bit, I, I don't know, maybe interesting is the best word, uh, to kind of try to occupy another consciousness that, mm -hmm. That it wasn't kind of identifying itself uh, in relation to others. Um, that wasn't which, identified. You mean you mean that the 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 that sort of male protagonist is essentially self engaged, or right, that they can kind of feel dropped into their consciousness for whatever yes. reason, and yes. and not not as a broad generalization about men and women, but just specifically comparing like a 14 year old protagonist of the girls to a lot of the male protagonists of these stories who are, you know, adults who feel themselves, you know, at the height of their powers in many ways, even, even if that power is fading. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm reading, um, uh, a biography of uh, the 
Beach Boys from 1986 right now. <laughs> it sounds delightful. It sounds like I will be it's a top <laughs> villain. And it's, it, it really, you know, it's all men. I mean, it has some, uh, you know, kind of secondary characters, the mom and the wives, the changing wives. But it really is so interesting to think of a world that is in a way so innocently protected. Um, n not that men don't have problems, you know, or like engagements with their surroundings, but I do think there is a, a thing about the sort of consciousness that is, uh, that you do very well, that is, um, you know, less concerned, let's say, with its environment or concerned with its environment only to the extent that it impinges on their own uh, subjectivity, you know? Totally. Um, totally. And, but there's and, something also very fun about that, uh, especially yeah, as a writer. It's also envy inducing. It's also envy inducing. It's, it's very, I'd like to be like that, you know? <laughs> like, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's something about it that's very complete, even if uh, yeah. uh, blinkered, you know? Um, so uh, this might be a, a nice segue for you to read a little passage from one of the stories. Um, this is from a story called Menlo Park, right? And do, yeah. do you want to set it up, set up the, the clip? Sure. For the story is uh, sort of told from close third um, of this editor who has recently been uh, sort of uh, I guess canceled, um, lost his prestigious magazine job in New York and has been sort of banished and uh, in his banishment is ghostwriting the memoir of a Silicon Valley businessman. But this is just a little um, excerpt about sort of the feeling of, of cancellation the ambience of being canceled. Um, okay. Things had not been great this last season. Enough months had passed that it might now technically count as more than a season, but it was comforting to imagine this mess cordoned off in a discrete unit of time, the benign kindergarten me measurement of a season. Mostly he watched a tremendous amount of television though he could no longer watch the show Eleanor produced, a show where celebrities discovered their genealogy. She always insisted in her mild Midwestern accent that the show was dumb, but people seemed to enjoy it, delighted to watch an hour long episode just to find out that Harry Connick Jr. was vaguely related to Buffalo Bill. He was smoking again, taking too many drugs, the strictly pharmaceutical, strictly in pill form. This distinction seemed somehow adult. He blamed Stephen, blonde, baby-faced Stephen, who showed up full of blistering tirades against the woman who'd replaced Ben, assurances that the office had fallen apart without him, ideas for projects they could start together, a podcast, a web series, a rich kid Stephen knew that he could hit up for funding, though Stephen was vague about when exactly the right time to approach this kid would be. After the art fairs are over, he said noncommittally. Ben had always been great at talking to rich people. That had been a basic requirement of his old job, being able to charm and flatter the wealthy people whose houses they featured in the magazine people who looked to him to offer their lives some tint of depth or culture, who donated money or joined the board in order to cement this feeling, this connection to him. Rich people made you feel like everything was possible because for them, everything actually was. Spending too much time in their world, you start to believe in life's inherent goodness, start to feel safe, exempt, certain of your own luck. Ben let himself get lulled by the pure proximity of money. He had believed, even after everything, that he might still be saved. But those people had disappeared too in the end, except for the board member who gave Ben's name to Arthur, suggested he might freelance his memoirs. 
a last act of mercy or pity. Ben was energized in these moments, brainstorming with Stephen, the ashtray filling steadily from Stephen's cigarettes. As soon as Stephen left, Ben felt worse. He shouldn't smoke, shouldn't hang out with kids in their 20s. A buzzing in his head, a tight skull, certain refrains of songs looped and he said them aloud and smiled. There was a night when he'd rushed to catch a train, late to meet a friend from the old days for a drink. The friend was ostensibly interviewing him for a job, but Ben knew it was a formality. Ben was essentially unhirable. Who knew for how long? Somebody must know these things, have some date in mind based on the relative severity of his misdeeds, but if so, no one was telling him. He'd been breathless, late, taking the subway stairs two at a time. Pushing through the turnstile, he saw, to his immense relief, that a train was already in the station. The doors were closed, fuck, but suddenly they opened with a pressurized exhale. Perfect. But then Ben saw he was the only person on the platform and there was no one inside the train. The dread came all at once. Ben decided to take the next train. There, easy, the problem had been solved. But the train didn't leave, idling in the station with its doors open. He understood in some oblique way that he could not get on the train, that the train was waiting for him specifically that to get on the train would mean passing from this world and into another. This was a ludicrous thought. There were many reasons why the train might be delayed, but it seemed to be there a long time, idling, and every moment that passed increased his panic. The train would not leave until he was inside. He was sure of it. The orange seats were lit brightly, and he saw the back of the conductor's head and shoulders but could not see his face, and somehow this was the most frightening thing of all. Yay, thank you. <laughs> um, being canceled is like uh, being in a pandemic. <laughs> Who knows when it's- we're all, we're all canceled we're now. All being, we're all canceled, right. <laughs> uh, for, you know, a variety of misdeeds. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, it struck me when you were reading this, um, when you were talking about how being in rich people's worlds, you know, everything becomes possible, but you have to sort of humor them and and cozy up to them, you know, is, if it's a donor situation or whether it's your writing, your ghost writing, the memoir of like a, a, a high tech mogul. And I think the question of complicity kind of like um, animates a, a lot of the stories. That would have been another good title, Naomi. Complicity? Perhaps a better one. <laughs> maybe maybe the next, maybe for the next collection. I know, I'm having regrets suddenly. <laughs> I'm loving this, this <laughs> title. Um, because it's really like, and this is a, a problem that we all, you know, or most of us at least, if we're lucky enough, we come up against this problem in our lives, right? That in order to, um, you know, get get to a position of power, like live more comfortably, uh, get the girl or get the guy, or you know, uh, you have to make these compromises that are morally compromised often, and uh, you they are justified not just by your desire for a better life but also for your by your um kind of like innate thirst for power or something or to be in the center of things so if it's like in a story like son of friedman where the protagonist is a sort of washed up producer who wants his sort of robert de niro like uh you know old friend to do him one last uh, one last favor and act in like a, a production of his or or the Menlo Park thing where you're like, okay, who's gonna save me like Silicon Valley money? Great, like, you know, what did these people do to get this money? Probably not great things, but like, what are you gonna do? Like New York canceled me or, you know, a variety of other things or there's this, or the ASL story where there's a woman who meets 
kind of uh, dis another disgraced uh, sort of chef, celebrity chef who did horrible things, but is interested in, is actively pursuing him in, in rehab, right? So what is it? What is it about that? Because it's not just about, oh, okay, like I'm Jean Valjean. I like you know steal a loaf of bread to feed my family. Obviously, this is it's more it, it's more than that. Like people wanting the 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 best and the most, and yeah. to do a lot for that. Yeah, I guess I think a lot about like ego and ego performance and sort of the construction of the ego palace especially with these characters, like the ego palace of their lives or careers or self narratives um, and sort of how alienating that ego palace is, uh, how separate it keeps you from reality. Sort of the, interesting this investment in the ego palace. Um, but, but I guess I find it such rich fodder for fiction because it's when you start talking about like what is what is this character's story of themselves versus like what's actually going on um and like the distance between those two things i guess is what i'm i find myself often drawn to yeah i mean yeah i guess that's where like a, a certain consciousness emerges and and one could say oh but these are this is the shallow stuff of life, right? Okay, who cares if a producer wants like his like incredibly famous friend from the 70s who no longer like cares about him because he kind of failed out to be in his movie. Like who cares about that? You know, yeah. people are dying. <laughs> or 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 yeah. when, you know yeah. it's, <laughs> that's haunting, haunting shit. You're right. No, 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 I, I care. I'm interested. No, no. I'm, I'm, it's what builds life up. I, mean, you know? I think this is why I'm so drawn to your work as like a writer at the New Yorker is because you often sort of pick these seemingly glib or seemingly surface topics and sort of probe them for what is beneath. Like, yeah, thinking just off the top of my head, sort of your Maybe it was your first post or article for the New Yorker, but it was about Ben Affleck's. Oh yeah, the, the Ben Affleck controversy. Like, <laughs> a, a lot of people would not think that there were like many smart things to be said about Ben Affleck's back tattoo. Yeah. But the idea of like sort of taking these things, which are very much in the zeitgeist and sort of very figure in our like contemporary experience yeah. of reality and like trying to parse them or sort of think, you know, what are the animating forces behind the, yeah. the things? Like yeah. I, I'm very drawn to that and I think- I think it touches are. like in, in your work, at least it touches deep hurts. <laughs> it touches a deep pain, you know? A person might be engaged, you know, is is might be a nanny who has an affair with a famous actor, you know, and then the story is uh, focalized from her perspective after the tabloids have discovered the affair and she's hounded by them. And again, it's like a silly, you know, 24 year old girl on the surface of it, like who cares, you know? But I think these desires that you map out are things that connect to deeper psychic structures, obviously, but are also writ large on the culture, you know? It's like, we all wanna like, I mean, you know, uh, cheat on, you know, we all want the star to cheat on their wives with us or what have you, you know, it's, it's like a, it's a, it's a collective fantasy and these people, embody right. sort of enact it for us yeah yeah, so yeah. I'm very interested in that in kind of the way that like I guess I would call this the daily mail genre of like news story which I feel that you are also very <laughs> into yeah. but it's like 
sort of as if everyone were a paper doll of themselves. Yeah. And had to sort of occupy these uh, places as either like heroes or villains. And it's these very like base, you know, not nuanced uh, sort of narrative structure, yeah. but cl they clearly have so much pull. Yeah. Based on how much energy people expend on these. Yeah. You know, celebrities or these stories. And like, I, I think I'm always interested in what happens when you sort of drop in for a little bit longer and sort of decide, okay, this person is a paper doll in this story. Like, what would it, what would it look like if I tried to fully inhabit that consciousness as a human being? Yeah. And like kind of, uh, sort of expand into that space. Yeah. And even if I bet that even if it's someone whose range, whose emotional range and psychological range and intellectual range isn't that, you know, wide, uh, there's still every person is a is a discovery. <laughs> right. Also like, yeah, every person has the full capacity of their like consciousness and yeah. like to experience every moment of their waking life. Yeah. And like that fact alone, like, is so, I guess, moving to me, especially when I think about these sort of news stories or, or any moment when people are flattened into heroes or villains or whatever. Yeah. It's like the idea that they're, whatever the sensational story is, behind it, is a person who has to exist, you know, moment by moment and has to sort of propel their neat sack of a body like through the day. Yeah. And it's no, it's not um, a surprise that a lot of your protagonists need to anesthetize themselves, you know, like there's a, there's a lot of like drinking and, and pills involved in these stories because consciousness is a burden. Right. Yeah. That was my, my yeah. UK editor was like, Emma, just one note. Uh perhaps like perhaps a little too many drugs in this story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um okay, it's uh we've been on for thirty two minutes, which means and I see we have uh six questions now in the little tab. So maybe we'll just take it to the audience and see what they say. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read them out. Um, we'll start with the first one. Uh, can you talk about your decision to write in the third person for all of the stories in this collection? How do you determine whether a story would be better served by a third person narration versus a first person? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess there's one story in the collection, and it's only one, but it's Marion. Um, but it's the oldest story, right? Like uh, the earliest story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all the other ones are close third. And I guess for whatever reason, uh, close third started to feel like the most natural way to drop into these people. It both sort of allows for the intimacy of being in someone's, you know, head, someone's experience but also gives you a slight narrative out if you need to sort of comment on the proceedings or have, you know, another consciousness sort of weigh in, which I think works, especially when you're talking about characters who are not necessarily, you know, the best people or who are doing things that might be a little, you know, wonky from a morality perspective. I think Close Third lets you both explain from their point of view why what they're doing matches with their narrative of who they are, but also have these little asides that hopefully let the reader know that the writer and the reader, you know, are, are never at any moment kind of colluding with, with yeah. this sort of bad actor. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Um, 
Okay. Uh, Emma, I love your work. Reading Daddy has been a total treat. I'm about to start planning, writing a novel because I keep running into the same character and narrative in my short stories. Do you have any suggestions in the planning slash organizing process? What does your own writing routine look like? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's so funny. I feel like I have so many writer friends who are so much more advanced than me with their processes and their writing routines. But I find sort of lately how it goes for me is sort of writing a barf draft where you get everything out. Of a story, of when you're talking about a story. Especially, yeah, especially yeah. with a story, kind of just going for it and, you know, not, not thinking too much about the structure, but kind of having a few points in mind with stories especially. I, I sort of know this will be a, an event in the story and this will be an event and how to, you know, somehow I will get from, you know, the party scene to the scene in the house, whatever. Um, and then sort of looking at what I have and only then kind of really trying to apply a more advanced consciousness organizational structure to how I might go forward. Um, but I feel like the first and most important thing is just to get something down and to finish it. Do you feel that way writing? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, I think the most embarrassing part is just sitting and, you know, getting the beginning out. I mean, I, I also, I really sympathize when you said that, uh, you feel like other friends and colleagues are more advanced because I always feel like it's it's a complete invention and this is not what a real writer does like when I when I do it. Um it's like yeah it's like everything that you do is like am I really doing this? Is this the thing? It's like is this being a writer? So maybe it's comforting to hear you feel the way too. But yeah I think just just starting is probably the hardest part. But and in yeah. terms of in terms of routine, do you have that was the rest no. of the question. I, I, I don't hate my friends who have a routine, but I'm always a little bit like shocked when I hear it. It's very they're, admirable. They're at the desk at 9 a.m. after like their like lemon water in the morning and like some journaling. Like this to me is yeah. very mysterious and very not how I work. Yeah. I feel like most of my work is not is not organized and then maybe for like two days at a time I'll be a full on psycho working. Um, and like I kind of have to recover. Yeah. But it's not it's not any kind of regular regular thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing to to I guess accept is that people are different in their routines and what might work for one person won't for another. Or you know, I think there's so much, uh, I mean, it reminds me of grad school when people would try to psych each other out by saying, oh, I was at the library at 7.30 a.m. <laughs> it's like, great. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Um, what else? I love the girls and cannot wait to read Daddy. What are some of your favorite books? Great question. Yeah. Uh, um. I mean, it's so funny. I don't know if you feel this way, Nomi, but like, as soon as someone asks me what my favorite yeah. books are, suddenly yeah. I'm like, I've never read a book in my life. Yeah, never. I've never read no, a book. Comes to mind. I know. It's so embarrassing. And like, <laughs> the embarrassing options come up too. I know, I know. And I feel like both you and I really enjoy a trashy book. Yes. Which are like the only books that appear when you think of this question? I only ever remember the last book I read or like yeah. I'm reading now. So I'm like, I, I'm really enjoying this Beach Boys biography. <laughs> I know, which I'm totally gonna get. I think a book that has been really important to me that I think about a lot is Mating by Norman Rush. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Have I, you read it? I read it just like maybe a year ago, like a few months ago, not, yeah. Uh, I really love it. Um, that book, there's a book called Endless Love by Scott Spencer. With the movie with Brooke Shields? 
I've never seen the movie. It's as but it's book, really a Zeffirelli movie. The Isn't book it? is so good. I've never read the book. I think you would really like it. Um, it it mean, was kind of a sexy eighties movie. Like the movie was like Brooke and the guy. And I think they, they did a remember it sort of recently. Really? Which I also haven't seen. But Endless Love, the original book, is really beautiful and sort of close to my heart. I think it it's lightly melodramatic. This is a great is, recommendation. It's so out of fashion, melodrama, right now. You know, yeah. I feel like I, everyone I is trying to be the feel. most like subtle, like non-fiction-y fiction writer that you can be. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that's what autofiction is responding to is like the inherent embarrassment of writing fiction. But yeah. like, yeah, when I, I remove myself. Yeah, when I read something like Endless Love, which is like basically like trumpets, this is a novel, like melodrama ensues, like that is what I find actually transports me out of the That's television amazing. that we're in. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into this I, because I never heard anyone. I know about the the movie, but I never heard anyone talk about the novel. It's great! It's wow! Truly great. Okay. Um, and then yeah, Mary Gateskill's stories. Oh I my god! Always so. I just I recently, I mean like whatever a year ago, I reread Bad Education. Just, just shockingly good. I know, so no, good. Did you yeah. read This is Pleasure? Her yeah, sort of so good. entry in the Me Too yeah. canon? So good. Thank, thank, thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah, so great. Yeah. Um, and I love Joy Williams. Uh, what books have you read recently, Nomi? Me? I think people probably want to hear from you, Emma, and we have some more questions. So uh, let me see what else has come up. Um, okay. Um, do you plot your stories beforehand? I guess you kind of answered that a little bit, but if you maybe if you want to elaborate, like how does it maybe how does it come to you and you know? Yeah. I mean, usually, especially with stories, I would say less so novel wise, but with stories, it's often like a particular image or you know sort of anecdote that i hear or just like a vibe that suddenly presents itself that has some kind of torque or some little magnetism and you're aura. like oh, i'm gonna follow that yeah an aura yeah um so i think yeah i, I have usually at least sort of one node of you know ambiance or aura that I'm trying to get to. And then it's sort of thinking about how do I populate the rest of the pages? Like how do we get to this moment? Or, you know, what what makes logical sense? If I'm trying to get here, you know, sort of what blooms out of that endeavor, like what other scenes could open up themselves. Um, and yeah, there's something that I find so beautiful about short stories because they're so compressed and limited that sort of every every turn of the, you know, hourglass, every, every time you kind of change from one scene to another, it has so much more weight than it does in a novel. Yeah. And I find like I often, or at least recently have started thinking of stories as sort of scene to scene to scene, but kind of how, how do you build up that sense of like life behind all the scenes or like uh, some organizing intelligence. Yeah. Um, that sounds a little bit like a, like a movie or like a screenplay Yeah, mm -hmm. more than a novel does maybe, or more than a yeah. novel. Yeah. yeah. I like I, I love novels so much and like I I love writing them, but there's something about stories because of their compression and because of the idea that you can read them all in one sitting, which is so like particular and so special. 
like I, I think there's like a a little more freedom that you get with them, like a little more like playfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and also you get to be a little more granular about sort of energy transference. This sounds very LA. No, I, I think I understand. There's just more, more weight to every moment because it's shorter. <laughs> like yeah. literally the proportion of action to space is more yeah. robust. Yeah, you get to be a little more granular. Yeah. Um, it's like my lazy generalization that probably doesn't hold up if you push on it too much. But I think about novels as kind of like surgery, like the stakes are life and death. Like everyone's working really hard. It's this like very prolonged, like very skill-based exercise. Whereas like short stories feel a little more aligned with like acupuncture, which is like these tiny little needles that are for whatever reason, like activating like currents of energy in your body it's like there's something slightly more mystical and like slightly more subtle and loose about them and like i, I find that an interesting space to be in as a writer yeah yeah i i like the sort of vibes vibes of this vibes. <laughs> no i do Okay, maybe I feel like we have uh, time for one more question. So just let me, um, uh, okay, hold on. Um, okay, what would you say were your biggest struggles early in your career? Example, anxiety, getting published, discipline. Do you have any advice for aspiring writers? I am consistently in awe of your work. Thank you. That's so sweet. Um, I mean, I, I think, I, and I'm curious what you feel about this, Nomi, too, as like somebody who has started, like the transition from being yourself, Nomi, and then putting your work out in the world of like, Nomi Fry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think for me, there was, like the little and you were very young when that happened like yeah. you you were 24 25 i think i think I was 25 maybe when the girls was finished yeah um and like maybe 26 or 27 when it when it came out yeah and i think the idea of having any kind of external like self that existed beyond me was very hard for me to understand or kind of assimilate. Um, and I, I guess I have no good answer to how, how not to do that. Uh, yeah, do you have a good answer? <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know, I think I'm older and yeah, I don't know. It's like life is a, I mean, when it's not like an actual, if we're lucky enough to not have it be like an actual battle in the sense of like, you know, your um, circumstances, economically, you know, socially, um, then it's, 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 uh, I think it's taxing to be a writer psychologically. It's not the hardest thing in the world. It's not like no. digging, you know, but it, I think it's, um, it's a struggle to like contend with yourself, right? Yeah. I had this great, um, Buddhist therapist who was also blind and somehow the combination, I was like, oh, this person is the smartest man who's ever lived. But he told me, he was kind of like, oh, may you be above praise and blame. And it was sort of like, oh, okay. The idea that anything outside of your immediate self is, yeah. not, is not to be trusted is kind of basically vapor. This is like um, the opposite of how I live my life. <laughs> oh. May you be beyond praise and blame. It's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> <We're> in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
the weirdest <laughs> therapist. Yeah. But uh, I, I think that basically that's true is that, that there's something quite like vaporous and unreal about anything that exists beyond your kind of immediate experience of the people that you love and care about and the person that you are and the work that you're doing day to day. And I, I, I think for me, that's always kind of like, how can I, how can I most uh, help myself not identify with any sort of external narrative, which is funny. I mean, I it's funny like considering what funny, funny considering kind of the about. people you write about, right? And the right. things you write about. These it's are like, completely animated. The perils of over identifying with your external narrative. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess I'm hoping this was a correct interpretation of the question and I haven't just gone off the rails. But I think she was also asking, she or he, uh, sort of what advice you would have for a young writer. And I feel like for me anyway, the most helpful thing, which I also feel like is so visible in your work, know me, is like sort of following your own interests. Yeah. Like even to a fault. <laughs> like, I think there's a lot of people who might say, like, oh, reading Anthony Kiedis's memoir is, like, oh, yeah. good use. We're reading it. <laughs> but, like, if that's an interest of yours, just kind of pursuing whatever it is. Yeah. Whatever little, like, your term it is that, like, most excites you. Yes. Or, like you know, sort of tingles, tickles you. Yes, I think like, that's great, yeah. That's what you're most after as an artist or writer of any kind is like your specific subjectivity, which is like yours alone. Um, yeah. Um, I think that's a great answer. And I think we probably should wrap up. So I think Christina is supposed to pop in and say good night. Is that right? Good night. Okay. <laughs> no, I, that's a that's great. I love that. The thing that tickles you. I think that's really that's actually a really good a really Absolutely. good. Absolutely, that's wonderful. So I just I want to thank you for being with us in our virtual bookshop in Miami, all the way from New York and California. I want to thank everyone who's watching from everywhere. Uh, remind you that you can order a copy of Emma's book by just pressing the green button at the bottom of the screen. And we really hope you'll do so. Um, and I can't thank you enough for a wonderful conversation, very insightful, uh, very lovely. And, um, and I hope to see you in person at Books and Books someday. So on behalf of Books and Books at Miami Book Fair, I wanna say good night, be well, Stay safe and keep writing. Yay. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, everyone.